Good evening. My name is Mitzi Thomas, and I am the chair and assistant professor of the Eye Care Assistant and Ophthalmic Technician programs at College of DuPage. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this most important community webinar, To Save and to Heal, Our Natural Hidden Powers, presented in partnership with Northwestern Medicine and Mariano's as part of the COD CARES 2021 Blood and Organ Donation Awareness Campaign with Versity Blood Centers of Illinois. First, I'd like to quickly navigate you through the COD CARES Roll Up Your Sleeves webpage, cod.edu sleeves. As you scroll down from this website, you'll pass through the video that you should definitely take a look at at your own time. And when you press on this first accordion, you'll see where it says roll up your sleeves and then it has dates Monday, April 12th to April 30th. So uh, usually um, this is a service day for COD staff and students and faculty to head off campus and complete projects in the community with a twist on the name. We've decided to shift gears and meet the critical needs of our community through blood drives and organ donation awareness. After today, there will be 10 blood drives remaining through April 30th. These are all visible under the first accordion that I just pressed on. To register, you'll just click and be directed to the Versity webpage. So you can see the 10 um, blood drives here. And then when you click on register now through Versity, it will take you directly to the area where you can see all of the upcoming drives. And uh, you click on one. So I'm gonna click on one that's a little bit in the future. And then when you scroll down, you can schedule your appointment. And then what you're gonna do is just choose one that fits your schedule and that you're available for. And you just fill out your information and press confirm. You'll then eventually get an email confirmation as well. So as I showed you, there is um, 10 drives remaining until April 30th. Let me also show you the second accordion if you press on, which is titled, There is so much more to give. We know that not everyone can donate blood. So we wanna look at some of the organ donation registries that have been compiled by COD Cares. You'll hear later in the webinar from Katie Adusi about her son, Max, and how his life was saved at a very young age through a kidney transplant from none other than his very own mother. There are plenty of stories here on the webpage to give you an idea of how challenging, life challenging some of these actions you can take really are. My favorite, of course, being in the field of ophthalmology and eye care is the eye bank registry. On behalf of the College of DuPage faculty, students, and staff, we encourage you to visit the Versity website and donate blood through Friday, April 30th and register for organ and tissue registries as abilities allow. We would like to thank College of DuPage President Dr. Brian Caputo for allowing COD Cares to kick off the countrywide blood drive on campus this past Monday. So now let's get into the webinar content. One registered organ, eye, and tissue donor can save and heal more than 75 lives. Every two seconds, someone needs blood in the United States. These sobering statistics highlight the need to unleash the natural hidden powers within all humans to save and heal others. Tonight, we will learn how COVID-19 has impacted the urgent need and blood and organ donations and how we can answer that need with a discussion with Chris, Dr. Christina Bartow, who is the medical director of the Blood Bank and Physician of Hematology and Oncology at Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. And she's also the assistant professor of pediatrics at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. And Katie Adusi, COD alumni, family nurse practitioner, and parent member of Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago Ethics and Family Advisory Board. Before we begin, I just have a few housekeeping notes to mention. All participants are muted with videos off. Please submit in questions in the Q&A box. Our panelists will take questions at the end of the discussion. 
The participant chat is open, but we will, but will not be monitored. The presentation is being recorded and will be archived for future viewing on the college website at www.cod.edu slash experts and on the COD YouTube channel. With that, I will hand it over to Dr. Christina Bartow, who will bring us behind the scenes of one of the busiest blood banks in the area. Dr. Christina Bartow is the medical director of the blood bank at Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago and is involved in working with dealing with blood disorders, blood transfusions, health equity, and increasing the diversity of blood donors. Her research publications include work on the patient-centered medical home model for sickle cell disease. Dr. Berto. Thank you so much. I am going to share my screen. All right, so thank you so much for that introduction. And I also wanted to say thank you to the College of DuPage for inviting me to this event. Um, so I'll start a little bit by telling you all about myself. So I am the medical director of the blood bank at Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. And throughout our talk today, I will tell you a little bit about what the blood bank entails, what exactly it is. Um, the blood bank does not have any money in it, but it has something which I think is far more precious. And I'll also tell you a little bit about the impact of blood donations for our patients and the children that we serve. So I wanted to start off a little bit by telling you about the impact of these blood donations. And this is from the perspective at our children's hospital, but it certainly applies to all hospitals who treat patients who might receive a blood transfusion. So we treat more than 200,000 children a year, and we transfuse about 14,000 blood products a year. And someone might ask, what is a blood product? So anytime someone donates blood, that blood is collected and you can call it a blood product. So you can see we have a large volume of blood products that are really crucial and critical to providing children with the care they need to get healthy and recover from their illness. Along with the 14,000 blood products per year, if you think about that on a monthly basis, we transfuse approximately 1,000 blood products a year sorry, a month. And that is a lot. And that is one of the reasons we'll be highlighting the importance of blood donation. So it would be remiss if we did not discuss the COVID-19 pandemic, which has impacted everyone over the last year and a half. I thought it would be useful to briefly talk about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the blood supply. So all of the blood that we have at our hospital that is donated to patients is donated by volunteers. And so they are a crucial part of us being able to provide care to our patients. So when individuals donate blood, they can do it in a variety of ways. So they might go to a university to donate blood. Another option is something called blood drives or mobile blood drives. And that's often referring to when a blood center such as Versity might set up shop, you could say, in a public space and have mobile or kind of portable blood drives. So this can occur at events like schools, it can occur at religious gatherings or other large scale events. Blood drives have even occurred at Union Station downtown. So when you think about the fact that not only do individuals come to blood centers to donate blood, but they also attend these large scale gatherings that have blood supplies, you can see how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected this. So with the pandemic, there was social distancing, there was shutdown of some part of societies, and a lot of these large scale events like school drives or large gatherings where we typically um, have blood donations, those are canceled. And so because of that, it did cause a decrease in the blood supply. So you could see that early on, and we certainly felt the impact at our hospitals as well as other hospitals um, throughout the state and the nation. Um, I will say that a lot of blood donors have responded to the call, and you can see that there have been different announcements put out that highlighted the importance of donating blood. So it is crucial to donate blood. Whether there's a pandemic or not, there is always a need for blood transfusions, but I would say this COVID-19 pandemic really highlighted the importance of it. So we talked a little bit about 
how many blood transfusions we use at our hospital, I wanted to talk a little bit more broadly about the benefits of blood transfusions. And you all might already be aware of some of these. So blood transfusions are useful for both children and adults. And there's a variety of benefits. So one of them is that blood transfusions help treat and prevent bleeding. Blood transfusions also help improve oxygen delivery. So when we think about oxygen, we know that oxygen is important for our brain and oxygen is important for our lungs and our breathing, but it's also important for oxygen to be delivered throughout our body. And there's a molecule in blood called hemoglobin. And when we transfuse red blood cells, that helps oxygen get carried not only to your brain and your lungs, but to all the other tissues throughout your body. And so that's why blood transfusions are crucial for that. So blood transfusions are a life-saving treatment for a variety of patients. So one of those categories is trauma patients. And you can think about that as, you know, a person might have an accident, they might be in a motor vehicle collision um, or have some type of accident requiring surgery. Those are one group of patients who benefit from blood transfusions. I'd like to talk a little bit about my experience with the children that I serve um, and our hospital serves, and that is children with cancer and blood disorders. So if we think about children with cancer, you know, cancer can affect any age group, you know, whether it is a newborn to an adult. And when patients receive treatment for their cancer, they often require blood transfusions. So part of the treatment for cancer, and I promise I won't go too much into a medical talk, but part of the treatment for cancer involves chemotherapy medication. And this medication kills cancer cells, but also as a side effect can damage normal tissues and make it harder for your body to produce blood. And so because of that, individuals who are receiving treatment for their cancer often require blood transfusions. So another group of patients who benefit from transfusions is individuals with sickle cell disease. And that is an area that I is particularly near to me um, because it's one of the patient populations that I see most often. So sickle cell disease is a blood disorder that's inherited, meaning it's kind of passed down from your parents. And these patients have a need for red blood cell transfusions. So blood transfusions are crucial for them. I'll share one story about how blood transfusions have impacted a patient that we've treated. So we once had a six-year-old girl and her mother noticed that she was having some slurred speech and this girl had sickle cell disease. So the mother called our office and we instructed her to come to the emergency department. So she came to the emergency department, was evaluated by physicians, and then had a variety of lab tests and imaging studies done, and it showed that she had a stroke. And so this was a patient only six years old, young girl with sickle cell disease who had stroke, which is one of the complications. And this is another example of why blood transfusions are so critical. So one of our main treatments for sickle cell patients who have strokes is with a blood transfusion. And so she received that transfusion and recovered from her illness, but will need to go on to receive regularly scheduled transfusions every month. So those are an example of some patients who require blood transfusions. It's also important in other conditions like individuals with kidney disease. And again, I promised I wouldn't bore you with too many medical details, but just kind of as a summary, with kidney, the kidneys are important because they produce a hormone that helps your body make red blood cells. And so if there is an issue with your kidneys, you might not make red blood cells as efficiently. So again, this is just four categories of patients who benefit from blood transfusions, um, but it really spans the gamut and can affect anyone. So next we'll look a little bit about behind the scenes of a blood bank. And so I'd like to briefly walk you through the process of how we receive the blood at the hospital and it's given to patients kind of starting at the beginning. So at the beginning of the process, volunteers donate blood, which is why a lot of you all are in this webinar. And again, one of the primary goals is to make sure everyone is aware about blood donation, the importance of it, and how it really saves lives. So volunteers typically donate blood, and it can be donated at a blood center like we discussed, or when 
social distancing measures are rolled back at some of these larger scale events. Um, but I do want to emphasize that blood centers are open to accept blood donations, and they have been open throughout the entire pandemic with appropriate social distancing measures. So the volunteers donate blood, and the blood goes through a variety of steps where it's processed and has testing done, and then it's sent to us at the blood bank. And so at our blood bank in the hospital, I have some pictures here that show what you might see at the blood bank. So on the right of the screen, you can see this blue structure, which is actually a refrigerator. So this is an exact replica pretty much of what we have in our blood bank and what you will find at many blood banks and hospitals. So blood products are stored in refrigerators or stored under other conditions. So if you go into a blood bank, you will see this bag of red blood with the O marked on it for blood group O and it's in the refrigerator and it's sorted by different blood group and blood types. We also have blood products that not only are stored in the refrigerator, there's some products that are stored at room temperature, there's some that are frozen and then thawed prior to use. And so if anyone has more questions about that, I can go into it, but I think it's outside of the scope of the webinar, but I did want you to know that the blood products are stored in various refrigerators or other devices like that in the blood bank. Another crucial thing about the blood bank is not only that we receive the blood products from a blood supplier such as Versity, we also do testing to ensure that we are giving the right product to the right patient. And so you might have heard people ask you, what is your blood type? And someone might say, I am blood group O, or someone might say they're blood group A. And so what we do is we make sure that the patients get the right blood that's matched to them so that they won't have any issues. Another way to think about that is that we ensure the right blood is going to the right patient and that it's compatible. So we do a variety of testing in the blood bank before the blood is even issued to a patient um, to make sure it's compatible for the patient. Also, blood supplier side of things, blood supplier meaning versity or someone who collects the blood, there's also testing done on the products there as well to make sure that it, reads regulatory, it meets regulatory and safety standards. So we talked a little bit about how blood donations are used and the different patient groups that they're used in. And then that we also have covered the role of the blood bank in the hospital. So I wanted to again highlight the importance of blood donation and how it saves lives. And I did want to talk briefly about diversity among blood donors. So we are thankful for every blood that is donated. Every blood donation that is given is issued and you know used by a patient. There's no wasted blood, I would say. We always need more blood to give to our patients. When we look about the diversity of those who donate blood and we compare it to the diversity of the US as a whole, we do see a little bit of mismatch. We know that the United States is a melting pot and we have patients from diverse groups and backgrounds, and we really would like to see diversity among blood donors as well. I'll talk a little bit about why that's important. So if you think about blood, we talked about how we like to make sure the right blood is given to the right patient. And there's certain things that help determine how good of a match it is. And so if you think about it as maybe a red blood cell having a fingerprint on it, not exactly, but you can think about it like that. And you wanna make sure blood is transfused from the donor to the recipient if they have similar fingerprints or similar patterns on their red blood cells. And what we've seen is that minority blood donors or blood donors that are from minority groups tend to be a better match for certain populations that rely heavily on blood donations. And so I can speak from the perspective of sickle cell patients. Sickle cell disease, again, is that blood disorder that we mentioned where this group relies on transfusions. So they rely on transfusions because they have breakdown of their own red blood cells that they make. So they need transfusions to kind of help keep their blood levels optimal. So what we see is that minority blood donors tend to be the best match for cell patients and we see similarities. I want to make sure that I'm highlighting that blood is needed from every group of people, not just minorities. Blood donation is needed from all groups, all walk of life, and it's beneficial for a variety of patients. 
Um, but it will be nice if we're able to have more diversity of our blood donors because that'll really allow us to give a better match to even more patients. So I think that's nearing the end of my portion. Again, I wanted to highlight that blood donation is important. Um, everyone among us is an everyday hero who can donate blood, which really is a life-saving measure and can help everyone from newborns to adults. Um, and so if you're interested, I think there will be more information and Mitzi also shared that as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Bartow. So next, once we have one, uh, one of the young patients who has benefited from Dr. Berto's work started life in kidney failure. His mom did not just give him life, but she also gave him one of her kidneys. Katie Adusi is a living organ donor who shares a very special bond with her son, Max. An emergency nurse at Advocate Good Samaritan Hospital in Downers Grove, Katie has been a type O plus blood donor since 9-11-2001, volunteers for the National Kidney Foundation in Illinois pediatric program, and is also a medical guardian for Honor Flight Chicago. Katie, your new mom story takes a totally different path from most. You had sleepless nights like most parents, but there wasn't because of a colicky baby. Max had some frightening health issues. Can you please tell us about your experience? So Max was born um, about six weeks early. We knew he was going to be born in kidney failure. Um, he was able to um, be transferred to um, the what used to be Children's Memorial Hospital and now is Lurie um, when he was two days old and um, had a couple of surgical procedures, was in the NICU for six weeks there. And um, then when he was eight, um, 10 months old, he was um, put on peritoneal dialysis and we started his workup for kidney transplant. So that is, that's the beginning of his story. Um, can you also please tell us what it was like as a donor? Um, any physical challenges, any side effects that you had experienced? Um, so I had um, what they call a laparoscopic assisted um, open surgery. So basically they pull your kidney through the front of your body. I know that sounds terrible, but um, I had like a couple laparoscopes in front and then a, a very small incision um, on my left lower. Um, so it's a six weeks of healing. Um, I wasn't able to work and um, or lift anything heavier than 10 pounds. Um, other than that, I don't really have any restrictions other than I cannot like take Advil or any NSAIDs. Um, yeah, so it's been, I've been really lucky. I went right back to work after six weeks in the ER and um, yeah, never looked back. <laughs> awesome. Um, so can you tell us how Max is doing now? Yeah, he's doing great. He's in fifth grade, um, does every basically everything that any other kid his age does um, he enjoys swimming and he loves to be in drama club a lot of things that we're missing this year of course with COVID um, but it's going back to school full-time next week so it's really exciting, um, exciting. Yeah, the only limitations for um, a kidney um, recipient is just, you can't ha really do any contact sports. So that's the only thing he really doesn't do, but every, everything else he is able to do. So yeah, he's doing really well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie, for sharing your experiences with us. Amazing stories and amazing bravery. Um, we do have some questions for our panel and we'll kick off with a question um, that's on the minds of many. The need uh, is so great and people do definitely want to donate, but they have many apprehensions about giving blood during the pandemic. Um, can you all shed um, some light on the issue during uh, issues dur uh, regarding safety protocols? Um, I myself had a fabulous experience yesterday um, and the, on the first day of um, the COD blood drive, I decided to go 
Um, and I hadn't donated blood in, gosh, it's been over 20 years, I'm embarrassed to say. Um, and main reason was because I used to be anemic um, and then um, you know just never got around to trying to see if I can do it again. Um, but just like Dr. Bartol mentioned, it was basically, I pulled up to the parking lot, there was a truck, I walked in um, and felt super safe. Um, the phlebotomist asked me a bunch of questions and determined that I was good to go, um, laid on a little bench and um, within like 20 minutes, they got my blood. Um, I will say it was a little big needle, so I was afraid for a second there, but um, once it got put in, um, I didn't look back at that needle. They put a little gauze pad so I didn't have to look at that again. Um, and um, they gave me a little snack and had me drink some water and I was on my way. So I personally had a really um, great procedure, um, felt super safe, everything felt you know uh, clean. Um, any other of the panelists wanna comment on that? Yeah, so I think that's great, Mitzi, that you had a fantastic experience. And like you mentioned, it highlights that it is safe to give blood even during a pandemic. So as you mentioned, you know, you went into the mobile drive and all of these drives in the blood centers are practicing safe social distancing. So whether it's six feet or more or less, I know the recommendations do change, but they are keeping that required distance between blood donors. So you will not be sitting right next to another blood donor. The staff are also trained in the most recent regulations and requirements for effective social distancing. And I think sometimes there can be a little bit of apprehension about giving blood. And like Mitzi said, you know, she had a good experience. I've also donated blood and had a good experience. So there's always staff there to answer any questions that you might have. When you come, you likely will fill out a short questionnaire. Um, to kind of make sure you're feeling well enough to give blood and donate and that there's no reason that you should not be able to donate blood. And then, like I said, there is staff there at every step of the way. I think one thing that's also helpful to know is that depending on what type of blood you're donating, sometimes the process can be relatively quick. So we have different types of blood donation. For example, one is called a whole blood donation, which might have been what Mitzi did. And you know, the actual process, once the needle is placed and the blood is drawn, is no more than 20 minutes. So it is a little bit longer just because there's a check-in process and you're filling out a questionnaire, but the actual process of donating blood can be as short as 20 minutes. There are some more um, sophisticated procedures where it might take a little bit longer, but know that once you're actually set up and hooked up and ready to go, you can donate that blood in less than 20 minutes. And so that's why it's really helpful. Um, Dr. Berto. This is Joan DiPiero. We do have another question. I um, wanted to know about the current state of the supply. Versity has said that we're locally at an urgent need level. What does that mean? So I would agree with that. And so that's a great question about, you know, what is the state of the current supply and what does it mean that there's an urgent need? So what that means is that there are patients at a variety of hospitals in the area who need blood and we have a low supply, meaning we don't have as much supply as we would like to be able to cover those needs as well as unexpected needs that come up. And so it is really important and urgent because there are always individuals who need blood and we look at the amount of blood that's required and then the amount of blood in the blood banks. And based on that, you're able to tell, you know, do we have adequate supply or not? So urgent, me urgent need, means the blood supply is running low and it is crucial to donate blood. I want to also highlight one of the reasons why the blood supply can kind of wax and wane. Again, one is it because it requires volunteers to donate blood, but also once you donate blood, um, those blood donations don't last forever. Depending on the type of blood that you donate, it might be transfused very soon. And that's why you always need a continual supply of individuals donating blood. So one of the types of components or blood products that's made from a blood donation is a platelet transfusion. And so platelets help prevent bleeding. So these platelets that are collected from blood donors the shelf life for kind of the lifespan of that is like five to seven days. So the time between when it's collected from the blood donor and transfused to the patient is no more than five to seven days. So you can see, you know, there's almost a rapid turnover of the blood. Once the blood is donated, it is given to a patient. 
there are some instances where, you know, if there's a rare blood type, it can be frozen and stored later. But for, for the vast majority of cases, you know, know that the blood that's donated is, you know, really given to a patient and sometimes in a quick process. And so we need that rolling supply to kind of keep up with the demand. Thank you. The other question that we've had, um, a couple of them now, how often can you donate blood and how do you encourage regular blood donations? Yeah, so that's a great question. So how often you donate blood depends on the type of blood product you're donating. So if you're donating um, red cells or whole blood, well, we usually say about weeks in between the donation if you're doing a whole blood donation. If you're donating something specifically like just platelets, that can be donated more often as often as every seven days. So it depends on the health of the donor um, and the, the time frame that you have to wait between blood donations. And that's really to protect the donor as well, because when we think about blood transfusions, you know, it's not just the safety of the patient who's in need and requires the blood transfusions, but we also want to think about the safety of our blood donors who are volunteering their time. And we don't want them to donate too often where their own blood counts become low. So again, it'll vary. And when you go to the blood donation center, they will let you know what the time frame is for the type of blood you're donating. But it can vary as short as um, a week or a few days for platelets to maybe a full um, eight weeks or longer for more blood donations. I think the other part of the question was, how do you encourage frequent blood donation? Um, if I'm recalling. So I know a lot of the blood donation centers or companies like Versity, you know, I can't speak directly, but I know they have um, great communications departments who reach out to blood donors to try to encourage them to donate. Also, when you think about events like that, that helps raises the awareness about blood donation. And then once you donate blood, you know, depending on the communication setup, of the facility where you donate blood, they might keep your contact information on file and reach out to you in the future to say, hey, are you willing to donate blood? Certainly you are never compelled to if you are not in a state or willing to do that again. But often if you donate blood, you might be asked, are you willing to be contacted in the future to donate blood? Another thing is, you know, depending on what type of blood the patient needs, if you end up being a good match for someone who needs blood and maybe has one of those more rare blood types, that could be another reason why you might be contacted to donate blood. Are there any side effects, Dr. Barteau, that a patient could, um, a person who might want to donate blood could possibly experience or um, what can we expect? I personally didn't have any, but I was just wondering if there are any side effects. Yeah, so that's a great question. So there are a few side effects of blood donations. They are minor and certainly do not happen to everyone. I would say, you know, one of the more common side effects or one of the possible side effects would be maybe a little bit of a bruise where the blood is donated. Um, so kind of where the needle's inserted, maybe a little bit of a hematoma, which you can think of like a bruise. And those go away on their own and don't require any special treatment. I would say one of the other more rare side effects, you know, might be if someone um, has what we call a vasovagal reaction, which is a fancy word for, you know, getting a little bit anxious and then almost fainting or passing out during blood. And you might've heard that happen or seen it happen, but there's also trained staff there for that. And so there's different techniques and maneuvers that we can do. But again, I wanna stress that donating blood is safe um, the majority of people do not experience side effects or complications. And for those of them who do, um, they're treatable and often go away on their own. We have someone who joined us in this conversation and Katie, uh, you're a kidney donor. And so is Donna Kemp, who has uh, donated, she's a living donor. She donated a kidney to, I think her brother. Donna, would you wanna join the conversation and tell us your experience? Um, sure. I don't know. Uh, I can't see myself um, on the screen, but uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Do I show up on, is my face showing up or no? No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, I, uh, my brother was in kidney failure um, 
I think I found out in at the end of, uh, uh, well, sometime in 2019. Um, and he's two years younger than I am. And um, I have four brothers and they, a couple of them tried to be a, first, first you have to be a match. You have to find out if you're the right, um, not just a blood match, but also there's markers. I don't know if, if Katie experienced that as well, but I guess there were certain markers that also had to line up as well. And I don't know if that's just because he was an adult. I don't know if it's different when it's an infant, I'm not sure. Um, but this was part of the living donation program that was done through um, University of Wisconsin. Um, and they had kind of a quite a rigorous process to go through the matching. Um, but once I found out I was a match, then we scheduled the, um, the transplant surgery in, in February. So it occurred February of last year, which if you recall, is pretty much right before pandemic was officially announced that it was a pandemic, but you know, it technically started right around then. Um, so, and it was successful, thankfully. Um, and it sounded, it sounds similar to what Katie described where there was, you know, mechanical arms that went in, you know, there were like five different port holes, I call them where the mechanical arms go in. And then there is an incision where they go in with another tool and extract the kidney um, to then, you know, be donated to my brother. But it was an amazing process. Um, really was felt very humbled and honored to be part of the um, process of keeping life going. So I highly encourage it to anyone who is willing to do so um, because it's, uh, has its own rewards and has um, obviously life-giving properties. <laughs> so, thank you for sharing that, Donna. I know that Katie has had a few scares going back and forth with Max. I've heard stories about um, Max's crazy mom driving down the Eisenhower Expressway trying to get downtown again to Lori. Um, but Katie, you had kind of an interesting um, COVID situation as well. Since Katie is an emergency room nurse, she took it upon herself to uh, have to leave home. Katie, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, it has nothing to do with me being an organ donor, but um, because um, Max as a kidney transplant recipient is on um, immunosuppressants for his lifelong. Um, so since we didn't really know what was going on with COVID and it was a little, um, I would say every hour at work, sometimes we were changing, like we're going to wear cloth masks. No, we're not going to wear masks. This is the PPE was changing every, every shift. And then, um, I was, I took care of I think the first um, COVID patient in DuPage County um, from the Chateau nursing home. Um, and so I was put on quarantine like almost, I think it was like March 12th maybe, it was really early. Um, so, so I, even before that, the day before that I had, um, I was doing clinicals for my last round of, um, for my um, nurse practitioner and I had been with another medical student who had traveled and she got a fever. And so I was like, I, it was just, there was too much going on and we didn't have enough information. So I had ended up moving out of the house just to protect Max. And um, I didn't move back until uh, June. So, cause it wasn't a time where I was like willing to stop being a nurse. And there were other times in my life, like before I was a nurse that I wished I was a nurse so I could help. So I was just really grateful to be able to do that. So um, it was much harder for my husband <laughs> taking care of the kids by himself and trying to do homeschool and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, so that's a little, little bit of what I did during the beginning of the pandemic. That's one of those things that people have to remember, Dr. Barito, Katie, even Mitzi working with uh, eyes and um, being close to a patient, you have to worry about yourself and your families. Uh, so thank you very much for doing that. Um, Mitzi, we had a question about um, 
the iBank itself. And mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about what happens with the iBank? Sure. Um, so if you are interested in you know, registering for the iBank or any type of donorship, that website um, that I showed you before pretty much has the different registries that, that you can be a part of. Um, as far as I donations go, um, most of the time it's uh, a cornea transplant that is done when, um, when you're doing an eye, um, anything related to the eye. They can also use the tissue for uh, research purposes as well because there are many um, blindness conditions that still have no cure. Um, so basically, you know, you would register on, on one of those, um, one of those sites, um, also on your driver's license, you want to make sure that you, you know, click yes on there as well. Um, and so, uh, most of the time, um, with eye donations, it is upon death that, um, they would be able to transplant that tissue. So even if you have many other health conditions going on, um, you may have, um, very good, eye tissue, uh, cornea tissue that they would definitely be able to use for a patient that has um, some type of a dystrophy, uh, corneal dystrophy, or something that's causing blindness in their eye. Um, and it's uh, actually a pretty cool procedure. Um, they pretty much suture the cornea into the eye. Um, and um, it's, it's uh, of course, there are, you know, uh, there can be times where there's rejection and whatnot, but for the most part, um, if it's a good donor for the patient, um, they are definitely able to see some patients that would come in seeing, you know, barely 2400, which is like the big letter E when you look at the eye chart, when you go to the eye doctor, they can get pretty close to the 2020 line, which is wonderful. That's fantastic. I know there's so many things that we can do with our little bodies that we were gonna, we have been given. Um, Dr. Berto, can you explain a plasma donation? I know there's different things you can do with blood. So what's the plasma donation? Yeah, so plasma donation is definitely interesting. So when we think about our blood, you can think about it being separated into a liquid part, which is plasma. And then also kind of a cellular part, which is when we think of like red blood cells and the platelets that I mentioned. So the plasma donation is very important because your plasma, again, liquid part, has very important proteins in it that form a variety of functions. So one of those is there's proteins that help with clotting, meaning they help prevent you from having excessive bleeding. So for patients who are or prone to bleeding, some of them do require what we call plasma transfusions. There's also another interesting use for plasma, and that's in something called plasmapheresis, which is a mouthful. You can also call that plasma exchange. So there's some conditions that are caused by antibodies in your body. And so these antibodies are also in the liquid portion of your blood called the plasma. And so in a plasmapheresis, procedure or a plasma exchange, a patient is hooked up to an apheresis machine, which is this um, fancy um, machine um, that can also be used not only to collect blood and blood donations, but it can be used for the special procedure. So for plasma exchange, the plasma is removed from the patient and in return, they receive plasma from a donor. That's very in different medical conditions that are caused by antibodies. So one of those you can actually see in cases of organ transplants. So sometimes if there's a mismatch between the donor and the recipient of the organ, that could be due to antibodies. And so a plasma exchange could be used where the plasma is removed and then it's replaced with fresh plasma from the donor. So it can be used in a variety of ways. So to stop bleeding and then also for medical conditions that are caused by antibodies. So plasma donation is something that I think people don't think about as often, but it is important. And so that can be collected from the blood donations at um, centers like Versity. You might also have heard of commercials from other centers that specifically collect plasma. And that also is used to manufacture different components that can be used to treat patients. For example, there's something called IVIG, which is IV immune globulin, and that's made from plasma from multiple donors, and it's kind of collected into a product and given to a patient. So plasma donations are very important, not as um, well known, but important as well. And when someone donates blood, um, along with the option of just whole blood donation, which is where they stick the needle in your arm and just kind of 
collect what you would think of as like the standard red blood kind of collecting in the bag. If the blood donation is from an apheresis machine where you're kind of hooked up to a portable machine, you can actually specify what type of blood components you collect. So you can specify, you know, whether it's red blood cells or plasma or platelets. And that's a um, conversation that you would have with the blood center and the staff because there are certain requirements um, that are needed if you kind of want to give specific components of blood. Thank you. I'm looking at this panel and our guest panelist, Donna Kemp, and realizing that you all have dedicated your lives to just being givers. Um, Christina, you are <laughs> at the hospital probably 24 seven and giving a lot of time. Katie, you've given um, part of you literally. Um, Mitzi, even when you were anemic, you decided, yeah, I'm gonna go back and give blood. You all chose the medical profession. I'd like to know why you chose exactly where you are. We can start with, with Mitzi. Why did you go into eyes? <laughs> Um, well, funny story, um, that was the only organ that I had any interest in. So my entire family, um, we got the nurses, we have the doctors, left and right. Um, but I was the person that was extremely afraid of blood. I know, I said it. Um, and so here we are today talking about blood all together. <laughs> um, but um, the eyes were uh, pretty much the organ that intrigued me. Um, I still remember like in my second grade science class, um, I was just fascinated with the eye and I did really good on that test. So that's how I chose the eye pathway. And um, I mean, honestly, I just love educating um, people now. Um, I love preparing uh, ophthalmic technicians uh, to help uh, the doctors with uh, eye care. And uh, a big part of our job is to, as technicians, is to educate um, patients on eye care and how to take care of your eyes and um, what you need to do to, to make sure that they're healthy. Um, so yeah, that's my story. Katie, I know you were majoring in geography, I think. I don't know how you switched to nursing, but give us the blow by blow. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, I was just someone that never knew what she wanted to be when, when I grew up. So yeah, so my first degree is a bachelor's degree from Elmhurst College in geography and environmental planning, which I used for one month. And then um, I, after that, I worked for um, DuPage County in, their, um, in one of their neighborhood resource centers in Section 8 housing in Woodridge. And um, it was kind of like a little two bedroom apartment in the middle of that community um, where the children would come after school and we would do tutoring. And we did ESL classes and helped get food donations and clothes donations and it was just kind of a catch-all um you know just being part of their community and at one point um i i would have i distinctly remember this um that a mom would bring their little baby and say they needed help um you know and they thought i could help them with medical stuff. And I had no idea. I had no clue at that point what to do. Um, but it that was kind of like a light bulb moment for me. So that's why I ended up going to nursing school. So I'm like, I think I would enjoy helping people in that way. And yeah, um, so I'm out of my 17, almost 17 years of being a nurse, I've, 16 of them have been in the ER, I cannot imagine working anywhere else. Um, and then this year I started working for our local school district because they need some help with COVID. So I, I'm really enjoying that little change of pace because I love working with children. So that that's kind of brought me back to full circle, back to working with the little kiddos, which is really cool. I know you're working with children, but you're also one of the aides on the honor flights, right? Oh yeah, I do that too. Yeah, <laughs> so old and young, okay. <laughs> I, I love old and young. I love everyone, but yes, old and young are my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Barito, what was your light bulb moment? Yeah, so I loved about hearing about everyone's stories. So for me, I would say the light bulb moment for me was kind of how much I enjoyed working with children. So I think, you know, at its core, I did have a love and a passion for science and medicine. So I kind of knew that, but the question is, you know, 
that I really want to pursue a career in medicine. And I would say, you know, I definitely did. And that was through different like shadowing opportunities that I had where I got to see firsthand, um, you know, doctors connecting with patients and working with everyone on the healthcare team. And so I think, you know, one of the questions is kind of what drew me, drew me to pediatrics. And let me say, I love working with children, kind of like Katie alluded to. I mean, kids are just such a joy to work with. You know, one of the things is that they are so resilient, you know, so we see kids, you know, from kids who are coming for just their annual checkup before school to some who have serious medical conditions, but, you know, really seeing how resilient they are, how optimistic they are, having a smile you know, be motivated to try to do better for them and here. I also have a degree in public health, so I really enjoy with all members on the medical team, doctors, technicians, nurses. Um, I really like the team-based nature of medicine, and so you really get to all kind of work together um, to provide optimal care for a patient. Thank you. Um, because of what you do, I have one last, it's not a question, it's just a comment from one of our viewers, and she says, thank you, healthcare providers, for taking care of all of us as if we were your family. 